Well, um, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome uh, again to one of the external lectures of the Centre for English Identity and Politics. Um, our regular attenders will know that this year we have two themes running through our events. One around the governance of England. Uh, Eddie Bowen for the Campaign for an English Parliament was here last month. Future speakers include Judith Blake, who's the leader of Leeds Council, and Paul Carter, the leader of Kent County Council, and Professor Meg Russell from the Constitution Unit, and they will be in the new year. The second strand that we've been looking at is diverse England. Um, what Englishness means in a very diverse country, a diverse nation. Uh, Trevor Phillips kicked that off brilliantly a couple of months ago. Uh, tonight's speaker will take that forward and we have a uh, seminar looking at these issues, a day-long seminar which will take place towards the end of March. So all of these events will be advertised on the website and we'll be right in touch with you. If you haven't some way through the process, let, let us have your email address do and we'll keep you in touch. Uh, we're engaging students in our work. Uh, we have at the moment a group of performing arts students taking the form of the traditional English mummers play. Uh, which was uh, very anti-Islamic and very anti-Semitic when it's evolved to try to subvert this and turn it into a piece of drama to prompt ideas about modern Englishness. And we have events management students running a, a conference for St George's Day event organisers and uh, also another group of students running an English festival for the university. It looks suspiciously like a beer festival to me, but uh, maybe that's, that, that, that's appropriate. Uh, but it's a, again, it's a packed programme for, for the centre. And tonight's speaker is a, a really wonderful guest for us to have. Um, she describes, this is where you find out, by the way, if Wikipedia is accurate or not. And uh, speaking of somebody who was once described on Wikipedia as having run the four min a mile in under four minutes in my youth, which, was, which there's no truth whatsoever, I'm a bit nervous about reading out what Wikipedia uh, now says. You will know Yasmin Alibi Brown as a journalist and commentator. Uh, she, it says in Wikipedia, has described herself as a lefty, liberal, anti-racist, feminist, Shia Muslim, part Pakistani, and a very responsible person. Uh, she's a regular columnist for The Independent. Uh, she commentates on many issues, including immigration, diversity, and multiculturalism. She's the founder member of British Muslims for Secular Democracy. Um, born in Uganda and educated there before leaving for Britain uh, just before Idi Amin expelled the Uganda nations. Uh, Yasmin studied at Oxford and then, having worked as a teacher, became a journalist, starting with the New Statesman. Uh, in addition to the Independent, she's also written for The Guardian, The Standard, The Observer, The New York, York Times, uh, The Time Magazine, Newsweek and The Daily Mail and has won numerous awards for her journalism, including the George Orwell Prize for Political Journalism in 2002. Um, she was uh, awarded the OBE in 2001, uh, only to return it a couple of years later, amongst other things in protest at the Iraq War. Uh, Yasmin, you're very welcome. Thank you very much indeed for coming here this evening. Thank you. Um, we, uh, yes, Wikipedia. I no longer work for the Independent. They sacked me <laughs> after 18 years when it went online. Uh, I'm still smarting about that. She'll never forgive them. Um, but the rest of it is pretty accurate, I think. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I was here a couple of years ago when the book first came out at the, the little local festival in the library. Um, so, what I'd like to do is very quickly why, what, and what I see the future as. So, the book was written as a response, um, in fact, uh, to UKIP, the English Defence League, um, the way in, in so many English people seem to be kind of turning away from their own extraordinarily rich heritage. Um, it was also something that came out of a very personal experience, which I shall read to you. Um, and, or, and the final reason was that an, an, uh, a particularly nasty man, young man, youngish man, 
who belonged to the EDL, was stalking me a few years ago, sending these terribly, terribly nasty emails, really horrible. But it would always end with, and you're a coward because you won't have coffee with me. And this went on and on and on and on. So I thought, okay. I said to him, I'll have a coffee with you, but I never want to hear from you again. And so we had this coffee and he carried on in this uh, oh, dreadful way. Her, his country had been a whore and left her legs open and we were the bastard children. And it just, he went on and on and on. And so when the hour was over and I stood up to go, I had my wedding bangles on, my gold Indian wedding bangles on. And he grabbed my arm, which was, by that time I was very, very upset. And he said, I like those bracelets. So I just laughed. I said, look, even you, even you cannot resist the glitter of the Orient, you see. <laughs> it's who you are. It is who you are, Englishman. So um, the, the political purpose was, and in part John has touched on it, I think devolution which the Labour government brought in um, was a necessary and important thing, but I don't think enough attention was paid at the time um, to the English question. I remember um, Tam Diel, who I liked very much, said, brought this up, and very few people anticipated the kind of unease, sometimes resentment and anger, that the people who see themselves as English would begin to feel after um, uh, the Welsh um, Assembly and the Scottish Parliament were set up. And in a way, I completely understand it. I remember when I was at the New Statesman, way, way back, very soon after um, devolution, I said exactly that, that, you know, it doesn't seem to me fair to give England only regional assemblies um, uh, and so on. So there was a kind of reason, another reason, for looking at the cultural um, anxiety that took over and, and in a way, you could say that UKIP came out partly out of that sense of the English feeling, you know, we don't matter. It being the biggest tribe, there were so many adjustments to make because when I was growing up in Uganda, Englishness and Britishness were interchangeable. You know, nobody separated them, and partly because of the language, perhaps. So if somebody said the English are like this or the British are like this, they were interchangeable. And then to divorce the two was, was, was a difficult thing. But the personal reason was probably the most important. My, my parents are buried in um, Brookwood Cemetery, which is in Woking, Surrey. You couldn't get more English than that, you know, the oak trees, the bluebells, the landscape of, of English landscape painters and so on. And there they are. And why are they buried there? They're buried there um, because as a sh particular group, I belong to a particular Shia sect. We are called Ismailis and we're modernist, evolutionary we men and women pray together, women lead the prayers, the great emphasis on education. And so we are not admitted into the main Muslim graveyards. Um, I'll give you that background. Can I just read this then? Um, I was in Brookwood Cemetery when the first thoughts of this book began to form. My parents are interred there. Blood in the soil has made the grounds lush and fecund. The vast burial ground is a place of abiding loveliness with big redwood trees and still dappled glades that shelter in spring snowdrops and bluebells. Nature garlands Albion while the birds sing in praise. And in the enclosure reserved for us Shia Ismaili Muslims, Ismailism is a minority Muslim sect. Our men, and, as I've said, they, they pray together. For literalist Muslims, Ismailism is an abomination. They shun us and keep our dead out of their graveyards. In contrast, 
Christian England lets in our dear departed. Bodies of Ismailis in plain white sheets and simple coffins are gently lowered into graves dug in Brookwood. Their last re resting place is in Middle England and will be mine too. What a tale of the unexpected this is. Um, there are rumours of ghosts in this necropolis. <clears throat> Shapes are seen in the green mist and strange babble is heard. Maybe restless phantoms, indigenous and immigrant, are speaking in a new composite tongue, a patois, as they moan and yearn for peace. In the same um, um, graveyard, there is a plot given to Zoroastrians, to Latvian airmen, uh, then what did I say, Turkish fighters. And originally, during the First World War, a beautiful little Muslim plot was created for Muslim fighters in the First World War. It's a mosaic of the dead. Terribly moving. Um, and, and I was struck, struck by this, that here we is, an England that is never talked about, is never described, an England which is generous and open and cultural, a cultural melange, if you like. I have to read you this little bit too. I'm married to an Englishman called Colin. He's my second husband. Um, and when I introduced my mother Jenna to Colin, first, 26 years ago. Colin, who unwisely wore a hoop earring and a bright lipstick pink shirt. She had stern words with me in Kachi, my home language. Look at him, she said, long hair, dressing like a girl. Your first husband was one of us and he betrayed you. You think this man will look after you and your son? The English are very nice people, she said, best in the world. But they don't understand family at all, huh? Maybe only at Christmas. Give presents, but no real care. Now, five years before her death, Jenna made out a list of who should get her precious bits of jewellery. She had only a few bits. My English husband was to get a small diamond stud. She'd lost the other. And in her last days at hosp in hospital, she instructed me um, to make sure Colin was one of her pallbearers. Um, he's more than my own son. He showed me so many places I never saw before in this beautiful country. This was her asking the impossible. Ours is a very secretive uh, faith because we're, uh, we're persecuted the world over. Uh, funerals are intensely private and restricted to believers. I had to persuade the elders to let Colin be part of all the prayers and rituals. And after secret meetings, they agreed. So the Englishman my mother so mistrusted helped to lay her down in Brookwood and wept. And that was the moment when I decided I had to tell this story. And what a story it is. What a story it is. Um, the most striking thing about, you start at the beginning, I interviewed a lot of people um, for this book, including Neil McGregor at the British um, Museum when he was still there, and Jeremy Paxson, and also to Simon Sharma, to explore this English identity and why it was so porous. 94% of us migrants live in England, choose to live in England, not only London anymore, across England. Why is that? Um, what is it about England that in spite of it being quite a tough place to live, most of us would no, lo no longer live anywhere else. Um, and actually, Neil McGregor explained it most clearly to me. He said, it goes back to the Reformation. When the church decided to separate and go its own way and break with Rome, a conscious and unconscious decision was made that the church that was to form would be entirely porous and not hard-edged, eclectic. Okay, there were moments when it, there, there was some, it became quite fundamentalist in its early history, but actually the decision was made 
that only by being inclusive could it take on the might of Rome. And once it had done this, said Neil McGregor, England could never again be isolationist or monocultural. Now this made a lot, I didn't know this, I hadn't thought about this, and actually Tristan Hunt and others repeated this theory that it starts with the Reformation. It also starts with Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare. I, I am mad about Shakespeare. Shakespeare names his first theatre the Globe. This is even before the Englishness, the consciousness of Englishness has formed. This plot of land is not going to be enough for Shakespeare, for the English. England is already meaning beyond these shores. And so the early history is really interesting. And as we all know, or some of us know, Daniel Defoe writing that wonderful poem saying there is no such thing as a true-born Englishman. There's a bit of Pict, there's a bit of, uh, you know, um, Anglo, there's Anglo-Saxon. There is no such thing. Um, so the early history is fascinating. There is... Um, uh, a, a kind of continuity now of course the colonial the slavery, colonialism I have talked about it in the book and the negative impact of all of these on, on um, English reputation if you like but also the world but equally equally there is a fantastic appreciation of what England brought so when I was doing the book I traveled to the Middle East and to India to see what people thought about England now, um, uh, young and older people, and it was fascinating. In Egypt, I was there just after the first um, Arab Spring when they got rid of Mubarak, and one of the greatest living writers there, who is a man in his 80s, is a, is a chap called Jamal El Jitani. So his, his own history is fascinating. He was a liberationist, anti-colonialist, so the British imprisoned him, the French imprisoned him, and then as soon as they became independent, Nasser, President Nasser imprisoned him because he could never stop opening his mouth and criticizing. He was a journalist and a novelist. Um, and so it's gone on. He's been in and out of prison all his life. So I asked him, I sat down and said, um, so what does England mean to you now? You fought against the British and England was the biggest, the kind of, you like, the dominant tribe of, of the, uh, the British Empire. And he smiled and he said, oh my dear, England is our minaret, which rather kind of took me back. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we want, we want your Magna Carta for Egypt. We want your freedoms. We want your governance. We want your liberty. We want a system which is uncorrupt. Now whether we are totally uncorrupt or not, I, we won't go there. I didn't, I didn't disillusion him. Um, but, but that's how history turned around. So from fighting the colonial um, presence, uh, the imperial presence, there is now in this very turbulent Middle Eastern world a real admiration. Interestingly, not so for America. I did not find the same feeling about America in all the lands that I visited. And it is this deep connection. I, some of you might know this, some of you might not. Gertrude Bell was an, a heroic um, uh, Victorian woman in the sense that she was a cartographer, an explorer, an extraordinary linguist who mastered about eight Bedouin languages in Arabic. She was also a spy and an ardent imperialist. And she created Iraq. She actually drew the borders which created Iraq. And when I went, I couldn't actually go into Iraq because it was too um, um, d uh, dangerous. So I, I went to, to Amman and talked to a lot of Iraqi refugees there. And they would say things like, oh, Miss Bell, Miss Bell, she's in our hearts. She knew our souls. What did Mr. Bush and Blair know about us? 
So, in a sense, and I talked to, um, oh God, I've forgotten his name, the Tory um, uh, MP who, who travels across Afghanistan, Rory, Rory Stewart. Um, he's about the only one in that mold, like Richard Burton, um, um, Gertrude Bell, um, ja um, Jack St. John um, Philby, of, of whom I will talk a little bit more. They assimilated into those worlds that they went into. They learned the languages, partly because they wanted to spy on them. But actually, like Antony and Cleopatra, I think Antony and Cleopatra is such an extraordinary play. Shakespeare never went anywhere. Here is Antony, the representative of the Roman Empire, going out east to control these wayward people. And these wayward people seduce him. And, and that is very often what happened with the English abroad. Very, very often. They went with a certain purpose, but in a, it, they, they kind of dissolved into the cultures. And actually, Jack St. John Philby, whom I, about whom I did not know anything, father of Kim Philby, the, the spy, he first went to India um, in the mid-1800s and uh, met Dora, an English woman who was in India, married her, and Kim was named after the Kipling character. And he learned nine languages, I think, fluently while he was there, including how to write them. And then he'd go, but his heart was, as so many Englanders, their heart was in the desert. They loved the idea of the desert. So off he goes to Arabia, befriends Ibn Saud. And you know, if we want to blame anybody for the most evil empire in the world today, which is Saudi Arabia, we have to blame him. Um, he befriends Ibn Saud, helps create Saudi Arabia, converts to Islam, becomes Abdullah. So if you, suddenly you begin to understand why Kim was the way he was. Um, and then writes these books on how the future has to be with Wahhabi Islam, the curse of our times, actually. So there are these reminders. Gertrude Bell, incidentally, killed herself. When her time was up in, in Iraq, she couldn't bear to come home. And there are some wonderful letters in, this, in my book, which she wrote home, about her feelings about Iraq. But even before, long before this period, there were... The Shirley brothers, I don't know if anybody in this room has ever heard of the Shirley brothers of the uh, 16th century, early 16th century. Three brothers from Sussex took off, went to Persia. Um, one of them then came back, I think, but the other two became central to the court of the Shah of Persia. They trained his armies. They became his ambassadors in Rome and Europe. There are amazing paintings of them with their wives. And actually some incredible plays were written about these, these, the, the, the courts, um, the, the court of um, uh, the Shah and these Englishmen who had become more Persian than Persians um, and the, were the most trusted people in the court. So what I'm suggesting is that Othello and Antony and Cleopatra are both remarkable plays which describe this Englandness, if you like, the Englandness that is easily seduced by the East, and then Othello, you know, who is both the the prize of the adventures abroad and the price that is paid because he then comes back. He comes back in, you know, the flows are out and then the flows are in, um, and. This, the story then expands into, if you look at science, if you look at architecture, I was just saying to John, I never knew that when Christopher Wren built uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, again, my mother used to say, whenever I took her out for a little drive, she said, it looks just like a mosque. And I'd say, don't be silly, Mom, it's a church. And now, what do I find when I was researching the book, that Christopher Wren's son, when he wrote a biography about his father, said... The, the architect described St. Paul's as a building in the Indo-Saracenic style. So actually, my mother was right. Um, there's also, 
um, the uh, the science story. Now, one other reason for writing this book was to tell young angry Muslims who have two fixations in their head. One is they've hated us since the Crusades. And the second one is Edward Said and his book on Orientalism, which was an important book, but it kind of fixed everything. It fixed a history, a complicated history. And in, in his view, almost everything that Europeans did in the Arab world was exploitative. Well, that's just not true. If you look at the paintings of the Englishmen um, in Arabia, uh, Frederick Lewis and several others, they are poignant paintings. Uh, they're all dressed up as Arabs and then painted themselves. If you look at Frederick Lewis's paintings of the interiors um, of, of uh, Egyptian homes, they are real acts of love. And when you go to Egypt now or to the Middle East, they love these pictures because that world is gone. That and nobody captured it but the English painters. So the story was always more complicated and much more exciting. And I say to the young, um, hot-headed Muslims, listen, there was no crusade during the time of Elizabeth I, none at all. She was enamored of the Ottoman Empire, partly because she wanted to get at the Catholic countries, Spain in particular. So she plotted, and, but she also loved their culture. So when their oligarchs came over, she had them painted on horseback in Hyde Park. She had plays organized for them. Um, and she, they were housed, many of them were housed in the home of the mayor of the city of London. And he gave them a halal corner so they could slaughter their beasts. Can you imagine that? In the heart of the city of London, establishment um, uh, London, these gorgeous, arrogant, um, strange creatures stayed there forever. You know, they didn't just come for a weekend. They stayed for a long time because they had such a good time and English women threw themselves at them and it was, it was rather exciting. Um, Elizabeth copied their fashions and she was so close to them that the Pope denounced her and said, this queen is too fond of the infidels. So the, the, what I'm saying in this book, really, is that history is never black and white. It just isn't. And I would say shades of grey, but unfortunately I hate that woman and hate that book. But that's what I mean, that there are so many, so many, um, so many shades that one can pick up if one looks for, for, for them. I'll give you a couple more examples. Immigration, okay, which is very hurtful at the moment for some of us. Um, when I went to my father's funeral in 1970, my father came here a couple of years earlier in Brookwood. I remember uh, I was with my cousin and I paid the taxi driver and she, he threw the money into my face and said, fuck off, Packy, we don't want you here. 45 year, 44 years later, no, more than that, this year, just three months ago, I tried to get a black cab in West Hampstead. I was going to Wilsdon Library. And he put down his window and said, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to Wilsdon Library. He said, don't know where that is. Not taking foreigners tonight. This is a black cab, yeah, which is breaking... A regulation. So times are bad. So, but the way I, I think we have to think about it is it's always been thus. There's always been this reaction and then it changes. So uh, when the Huguenots came in the 17th century, exiles, religious exiles, main, mainly from France, they were hated, their businesses were burnt down, plays were written about, these foreigners are taking... Uh, the jobs of true-born Englishmen. Um, and there was a very interesting example. The king wanted to give them full uh, rights in that once they were here, they would be treated like uh, everybody else who was born here. And the bill went to Parliament. And there was a, an MP called Sir John Knight from Bristol who wrote a pamphlet saying 
throw the bill out of for, uh, throw the bill out of Parliament and kick no, kick the bill out of Parliament and kick the foreigners out of England. Parliament had that pamphlet burnt because they said we do not speak like this in this house. So I reassure myself that there have been these moments when we came. So after that, the Jewish presence, as we know, through the centuries, they were invited because they were good. You know, they had capital that they could lend. Uh, but whenever it suited um, uh, various interest groups, they were attacked, they were thrown out, they were killed. Um, when we came in the, uh, 1970, oh my goodness, they love Ugandan nations now. Even Nigel Farage told me, oh, we like you people. I said, well, you, wouldn't, you didn't when we came. Enoch Powell was in his prime, um, you know, and there was, it was just awful um, coming in. But now, it seems to me, except for me, all my compatriots made a vast amount of money. And so all the, all the political parties just love them, just love them. But it's that cycle. Huguenot set up, helped to set up the Bank of England, um, became very successful. We know about the Jewish story, um, the Chinese story, and so on. So I'm hoping when Afro-Caribbeans came, they were English in all but color. They were Christians. They knew everything there was to know about English history, English literature. They spoke the language. But they had just as hard a time until, until the next wave. So I'm imagining very soon the Poles will become the most favored immigrants and then there'll be somebody else to... Um, but it is a fascinating story. It's almost a rite of passage. But, and how many people stand up to that? That's what I think has gone missing at the moment. We had extraordinary people across the political spectrum. Ted Heath. If you ask me who my favorite politician ever is, it's Ted Heath, although I'm a, I'm, I'm a lefty. Because he had the courage when Enoch Powell, and uh, you know, he was, Enoch Powell was much more popular than Nigel Farage. Much more popular. Ted Heath sacked him from... Um, the Conservative Party after he made those ghastly speeches which now of course you hear more or less all the time but there's the cultural aspect as well which is so fascinating the first takeaway in this Indian takeaway in Britain was started by an English woman in the 17 something something I can't remember the exact date she was this intrepid English woman adventurous who took off on a boat to India because she wanted to travel. Um, what was her name? Hannah Glass? I think her name was Hannah Glass. And um, then got caught up in the Anglo-French war in India. And then got caught up in the in, um, war with Tipu Sultan in Mysore. And was captured and imprisoned in Mysore. So she learned the language and she learned to cook. And they were so impressed, they let her go. So she, and she also had an encounter with a tiger, apparently. She was quite a somebody. Came back here, and in Marleybone opened a little takeaway, because there were already East India Company men who had returned and couldn't bear bland food. So she would make these pots of curry and rice, and gentlemen would send their carriages to pick up the first takeaway. Um, in this country um, I, I've talked about the art science and this really when I tell young Muslims this it really affects them actually when the Royal Society was set up in the 17th century all the Eng it was mainly English scientists like Boyle and so on with a few there was a Hungarian and a German the original rational post-enlightenment scientists. The English scientists in this group taught themselves, learned deep Arabic, both to speak and to read, because they wanted to read the texts of the 8th and 9th century um, um, early astronomers, physicists, um, optical sciences in the Muslim world. We had this amazing golden age. I don't know where it's gone. Um, but, but 
they did not trust the Latin translators. And the Archbishop Lord and uh, Charles, I can't remember which Charles it was, sent emissaries to the Middle East, to Aleppo mainly, you know, which is destroyed now, to buy manuscripts, buy scientific manuscripts and bring them back. And if you go to the Royal Society Library, you can actually see these amazing books. And in the frontispiece, I took a group of young Muslims there. I said, look, on the frontispiece of their books, there's some turbaned man, Ibn, Ibn, somebody or the other, and it will say things like, on his shoulders I stand. So the relationship is, was not one of enmity. And even when it was pretty horrendous, like, uh, you know, when the traders first went to um, Aleppo and, and on the Silk Route, some of the um, uh, Christian um, churches here got very exercise that they would never return. They would be spoiled and they would forget their faith and, and Christ and so on. So these, uh, they started sending men out to, to Syria and Iraq to make sure they stayed Christian. And one of the worst ones, the most bigoted ones of them, and he's in the book, you know, was very, very adamant about what they could do and what they couldn't do. But even he couldn't resist saying, actually, these Arab women are so much better than these flighty English women who just gad about and go drinking and gossiping. These women, these women, he said, stay at home and they sew and they cook and they look after their men folks. He, even he couldn't quite hate as much as he thought he would. There are so many extraordinary stories and I'll end with just the most remarkable one. There were several English slaves. It's simply not true that the English were never enslaved and it's thanks to Linda Colley who, f who first wrote Captives about 10 years ago. The first book which examined the history of English slaves and they were taken from Devon, Dorset, Cornwall by uh, Barbary slave, um, pirates, by Ottoman uh, navy, um, um, greedy navy men and women, men, and taken to the north of Africa, to Istanbul, and various places. Eventually the king sent uh, an ambassador with a pocket full of cash to get them back, and more than half of them said, no thanks, having a really good time. I think we'll stay. And so if, I'm sure if you did a DNA of, Al, of, uh, of uh, people living in Algiers and parts of Tunisia, there is English blood over there, and certainly in, um, the, uh, in Turkey, in, in the Ottoman um, capital, where the most powerful eunuch of his day was a man called Hassan Aga, who came from Great Yarmouth. I end on that. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Esma. That, that was wonderful. I'm sure everybody will uh, agree. Um, quite interesting listening to you talk that, that sometimes these stories are beneath our feet and we never think about yeah. them. Here in Winchester, we're five minutes away from Jewry Street. Yes. And friends here from Southampton, French Street, of course, is where the Huguenots settled who worshipped at the French church. But we go past these things every day and never think about what they mean. So thank you for bringing that to the fore. Uh, Yasmin's uh, agreed to answer uh, some questions or to take some questions. So um, I think we have a roving mic here. Yes. So uh, usually pass it from one to the other. But who would like to ask the first question? Always tough. Yeah, always tough. I can't possibly have silenced you. Come on. Can I ask you, just to get the questions going, um, how do we utilize this history most effectively to answer the challenges that lie ahead of us, which you've touched on several times? But is it, is it the knowledge of the history? Is it, is it the teaching of it? How do we use this? I do, I do think... Um, uh, you know, the, the incomplete histories um, are not just wrong because 
you know, they keep, tell you a partial story. But because it's an entitlement, our children need to know this because it's who they are. It's who they are. And I find it very hard to accept that my own kids, they went to school here and they know nothing about what I've just described to you. You know, that there is such a narrow curriculum. And certainly, a joyous celebration of this England would make a huge difference, I think. Um, the reason that I'm, I'm celebrating this England is because sometimes you need positive news to bring people with you. And I certainly think that sometimes the news on England is... And especially, you know, from Scotland and Welsh, there's a kind of very strong anti-Englishness. Um, and and I, I've always thought it was important to kind of bring this other side out. And I also have very di great difficulties when I take the book to Scotland, when they tell me that, you know, they were the first victims of England's uh, imperial ambitions and we were the next, and I say, but actually you were there. I was there, and you were there, and you were actually at times worse than the England, uh, English people were, but, you know, the rewriting of history. I think we need festivals. Mm -hmm. We need festivals of this Englishness, where you can do performances, where you can really bring out all these aspects, um, from food to art to sex. I forgot to talk about sex. Ah, ah, let me tell you this, let me tell you this. 1567, the first panic about English women taking up with black men and producing dark-skinned children. Think about that. It never happened anywhere else. And so when Othello was written, English women were really having, breaking through these borders, you know. So that's a story to, to uh, celebrate too. Up there, on the, uh, on the right hand side. Who would like to have the next question? Because we'll then know which direction to pass the microphone down towards the front. Okay, so we'll try and get two microphones here. Hello there. Um, yeah, I haven't quite sort of formulated it ex exactly. I've got something written down here, so I'll go, okay. I'll go from this. So sort of apart from the um, aesthetic values and sort of the, maybe the ideas of greater freedoms, what, morally speaking, do you think is the value of diversity, not just in the UK, but uh, in, in any country? And I'm thinking sort of perhaps from the perspective of indigenous peoples who might not want to have their... Um, lifestyle change or perhaps from sort of the dominant um, uh, parts of society who see no real value. So what sort of your guiding well, principles? Well, what I'm saying in this book is it's not, it's not a choice. It's uh, not uh, a choice. We are all really diverse, inevitable. you know. So I think it's knowing how diverse, particularly England has been, that its identity is not the identity that Mr. Farage is selling. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if anybody here thinks he's a hero, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, because he's narrowing uh, the heritage of this country. Mm -hmm. And that heritage would have been diverse whether we had come or not, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It was diverse from the time of Elizabeth I. And so it's understanding that it was very, like the, the EDL man who loved my bangles, right? Mm -hmm. um, my mother-in-law who reads panic uh, new, uh, stories in the Daily Mail every day, you know, lives in, in uh, Brighton, ask her her favorite food, it will always be curry, mm -hmm. yeah? So this has been her favorite food, as she told me this, from the time of the war. And they didn't have very nice curries then, but they had spices. So even if we hadn't come, England was diverse. Scotland, not so. Scotland, not so. And which is why I would find it very difficult to live in Scotland. Because there isn't a natural... And this is why the Reformation and what the churches did is such a central part of the English identity. Now, diversity as a value, I come from a faith where at one time, not that long ago, we could be any kind of Muslim. You could be 
a Shia, a Sunni, a half a Muslim, a drink, I drink, I don't lie. I think probably it's a good deal, that one. Um, and um, now, just terribly quickly, there's only one way we're told we can be a Muslim, and diversity is being killed. And so we're living in a very strange times, I think, where fear of diversity has grown even in societies which are... India is another example. India is the most diverse nation probably on earth and it now wants to uh, Hindu fundamentalism is moving it moving diversity underground so I you know Shokran Okay. How, how, how okay. Work on that? Um, well, two things. This country was very receptive to Muslims in Woking, near where my parents are buried. There is a beautiful purpose-built mosque, which was built in 1888. It was the first mosque built after the Moors were banished. Why was it built? Because Victor Queen Victoria wanted it built for her servants because there were so many Muslims here studying, they needed a place to pray. The architect was English, the builders were all English. Um, many converts, upper class converts, like Lord Stanley of Alderley Edge, backed the project. We were at peace, and that's also in the book. Regent's Park Mosque is built on land given by Winston Churchill to Muslims. And I tell young Muslims that, you know, think about how much presence and respect we had. The reason we are where we are is because of Saudi Arabia. And we will not break with Saudi Arabia. Successive governments have continued this relationship. Saudi Arabia has spent one and a half billion dollars disseminating its extreme segregationist, hard Islam. It's not the Islam I grew up with. It's not the Islam my mother practiced. And they are powerful. And we're doing nothing about it. So this is a relatively new pro pro problem. And I think we can only do something about it if our government stops the Saudis from this propaganda exercise. But they won't do it. I mean, look, for the first time, I actually agreed with Boris Johnson when he said what he said. I totally agreed with him. And look what happened to him. So this new hard Islam worries us as much as it worries you. And I work very hard to try and do something about it. It's a losing battle in a way. Because I keep saying to them, you're not, you can't live in this country and not be part of it. And, if people, and the other book I wrote at the same time as I wrote this was a book called Refusing the Veil, where I've said, I cannot bear it that you walk around. As, as a feminist, my mother and her friends one Friday went to mosque. I wasn't alive then. They went to mosque one Friday together in, in Kampala and took this thing off and said, never again. And our leader, our worldwide leader, backed them. So. Thank you. We line up another question. If you could pass that microphone up behind you there, and we'll take your question, please. I just, so the mic's just coming. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, I just wondered how you, if you feel that journalists and, and journalists have um, the potential to, to do something about the problems, and if you, you know, it seems to me that this a, a lot of people feel that the new wave of problems that we're having 
comes from. Yeah. From I Germany. think the media has been a shocker in the last few years. I'm so ashamed of, of my industry, really, because if you don't give people accurate information about anything, whether, you know, it's uh, um, the facts on Brexit or the communities who live here, um, you create the... I mean, I was saying to John on our way here, I am terrified that we're living worldwide in pre-fascist ti uh, times. If you look back at the, at the 30s, you know, scapegoating the other, uh, right. hating it, and mistrust, as, uh, getting social mistrust to such a level, even between neighbors. And always remember, it didn't take, it took three men, three months, to do what happened in Bosnia. Three men, three months. There were neighbors, Muslims and Christians and Jews living completely. There were mixed marriages. They went to the same schools. It took three men, three months to create the havoc. It can happen any time. And I, I really feel good people have to stand up, and particularly the English, because there is such a, an extraordinary heritage of acceptance and joy in, in um, the world, really. And if we lose that, I mean, really? You want to eat boiled cabbage every day because it's English? I mean, come on, you know. Um, not that I'm suggesting English eat boiled cabbage. I'm not. <laughs> um, Thank you. Question for the We all do, we all do, we all do. We all do. What can I do as a person when I go back? Well, I did a lecture tour about the book in the States in October, in places I hadn't been to, like Colorado, Pennsylvania. I found the young people astonishing. I mean, the young there and here have been really stuffed by the old, you know. And they, I think there's such a future. If those young people, in, I remember in Colorado Spring, there were 600 young students in the audience. And I just thought, if this is the future, there is a future. But there is a very dark interim period, I think. And I've just returned from Mexico two days ago. And I, talking to Mexicans, you know, in Mexico City. Um, so, um, but I, I'm not a, I'm pessimistic in life, but I'm very optimistic that the forces of darkness cannot prevail and shouldn't prevail, and we should fight back, even if the comeback is so difficult, you know. Um, the worst thing that's happened here is the rolling over this sense of helplessness, this sense of we can't do anything, um, and we have to. I mean, I've been reading Edmund Burke, and Edmund Burke said this, and this may not be exactly how he said it, but he said, if good people do not associate, they will fall one by, when you know, bad people get together, if good people don't associate, they will fall one by one by one in this contemptible conflict. Isn't that just beautiful? So we have to fight. We have to fight. Thank you. 
question here. Is there one other one to follow? One right there, back there, and one at the front. So, um, where does that microphone go? This lady's got one here, Jessica. Um, yes, um, I really enjoyed the lectures. It was very erudite and very um, interesting. Uh, I was just wondering, do you think that um, your message might be more powerful if, if you could get um, some uh, sort of a wider audience by getting it published in some academic journals? So, um, it's just that I went online here at the university and I was, I was looking and none of the contemporary journals are carrying any of your work. Um, you know, you... They think I'm low rent. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, no. If, if I don't write in an academic style. Right. So, but yeah, send me, send me any op opportunities and I'll do it. I'm Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think academic journals are difficult because they have their style and, um, you know, you, I am a professor though now, research. so I have to... Huh? You need to have research, you need to have that, that work well, behind us. Well, there's substantial us. research. So I'm now a professor at Middlesex University, and so we're doing quite a lot around the book over there, um, you know, getting papers and getting... Some of this I've just touched on, and it would be really nice if history students, sociology students took it up and um, explored it further. Yeah, I, th I think that would be fantastic. Thank you. What I might add is one of the things the centre is able to do um, is actually to publish ourselves, and the university supported us in doing that. So we've had two publications this year, one a series of essays edited by Tristram Hunt, and a second largely of academic contributions looking at lab the Labour Party and the challenge of England as a particular issue. And this series, including Yasmin's talk and Trevor's and the seminar uh, that we're having in March, will also be brought together. So. That doesn't make it an academic journal, but we are actually trying to disseminate really creative, interesting, imaginative writing into a much more accessible form. So it's not just an, a, an audience that, reads, that hears it here tonight. So that's one of the roles we see ourselves playing. Uh, question at the back and one at the front, and then uh, we'll probably call it a day. Well, I mean, I think, you know, um, as Samuel Johnson said, patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. I don't think anybody should feel particularly pressured to feel proud of an entire uh, identity because every identity is flawed. It's got its good and its bad bits. Where I think it helps, I think, to feel good about aspects of one's story is where you accept that some terribly bad things were done by the British, by the French, by the Portuguese, um, you know, by uh, the Spanish. I mean, in Mexico, I was talking to so many Spaniards, you know, who have this view about the Spaniards. But at the same time, like I said at the beginning, history is never black and white. And that through this interaction, some incredible things came out of the fusion, the fusion. And certainly, I think, culturally, the English and the British can feel proud that culturally they produced a dynamic culture out of the meetings of the peoples when they went abroad and when they came back. Um, there are some French people quoted here as to why they moved to England. And it's quite interesting why they moved. They find the dy dynamism of the culture extraordinary. And this goes back. And that's something to feel really good about. But what isn't right is to try and deny the terrible things that have happened during the, the bad periods of empire. You know, I like the humiliations the exploitation we have to hold both in our heads the Ottomans were just as bad the Ottoman Empire was at one time the biggest empire in the world 
They did terrible things and they did wonderful things. So when my Turkish friends say, oh, we had the empire, I said, yeah, yeah, but what did you do to people? Think about it, you know. I think you can hold both together. It's like a family. You know, all families have some bastards and then they have some wonderful things about the, the family um, that they've made. Um, but there's no... I think not having any sense of responsibility or guilt is not possible at the same time. It was an astonishing enterprise. You can't take that away from you. Made me who I am, made you who you are. You know? Thank you. Last question. Uh, thank you very much for all your comments. And I found them very, very stimulating. I, I, I went to a grammar school and it seemed a multicultural yes. school, my recollection. And my working life was, I felt it was multicultural. I wanted to continue that way with my children and grandchildren. My worry is that did I absorb that through education, and if that was the case, have we got to improve our education yes. system to let us understand more about the world around us? Because we seem to be Listen. determined to economise on every single social thing that we do, and that's going to make it more difficult. Oh, yes, no, I think you're right. The education system got narrower and narrower and narrower over the years and it, it, it's not serving our children very well. Same things happened in America, um, I think. Um, so yes, it, li it lies with education, it lies with media. The arts, I think, are splendid. The arts are really able to absorb, continually to absorb this richness and express it. Um, but, you know, com again, compared to most other European countries, or even Canada, where I go quite a lot. There is a deep history of, of, of uh, cultural diversity here, which we really must not lose. We must not lose. May I tell them one last story? Please, no, I, 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 it's such a brilliant story. Somebody needs to make a um, film about it. There was a man called Thomas Dallam. Does anybody here know about Thomas Dallam? He was a, a, a working class, brilliant craftsman during Elizabeth the first time. Elizabeth wanted trade, like all Europeans wanted trade with the Ottoman Empire. So she got Dallam to make an organ of such exquisite beauty um, that, that he, the Sultan would be blown away and give them the trade deal. So, and then she asked him to flat pack it and take it over. She was really astute. And then to make it in Top Kapi Gardens slowly so that all the gossip and, and curiosity would grow and present it. And this is exactly what happened. They had a storm, they nearly died at sea. They gave the, the, the organ to the Sultan, who so loved it that he took Thomas Dallam into his harem, the first man ever to be taken into the Sultan's harem. Um, and uh, then he said to Thomas, stay here, be part of my court. You can have any of these women, all these women, just stay. And him being a simple man, he said, I have to go back. I must go back to my country. Um, now the sultans, so he comes back here, is ordered to make a, an even better organ for King's College, Cambridge, which he does. So what happens next? The sultan's son was a Taliban man. He had this thing destroyed. Apparently it had beautiful flying birds and things. And Cromwell's men destroyed the organ that he made for King's College. So you see, Puritans are the same everywhere. <laughs> thank you, thank you so, so, so much. Um, that was fascinating, but inspirational and optimistic. Well, one of the things I found when I came here to Winchester to set up this centre was there was a certain reaction that said, well, if you're talking about Englishness, you must be talking about white, racist, or xenophobic. And I said, I think you'll find there's a bit more to it than that. And you have illustrated that perfectly this evening. So thank you very much indeed. Can we thank Yasmin again? Thank you. Thank you. I, I
two bits of good news. The first is the bar will continue to be open for about 20 minutes. Uh, and, and the second is that Yasmin has agreed to sign some copies of her yes, book. Yes, buy my so books. Yes, buy Authors don't make money. you all want to know 